how they okay oh dear there we go how they're used and what the problems are with them <clears throat> so this in the lamp yeah a couple of disclosures i have a number of uh, grants related to artificial intelligence in imaging particularly in, in lung cancer and pulmonary nodules and i have a software platform i've set up for people to self-assess their ability to interpret imaging which has been spun out called rake so the first thing to say is there's been a huge amount of hype about um, ai and medicine and what i've put up a couple of things here but what i want to point out is that look at the date these were 2016 and they effectively said that AI is going to remove quite a lot of medical and legal work um, in the same way they said they'd replace lorry drivers. Yeah, so that was 2016. And those were um, the one on the left was the Harvard Business Review, the one on the right is the New England Journal, so fairly august journals. And then the Lancet uh, think tank called Reform and NHS England suggested that. Um, doctors may be replaced to a certain extent by artificial intelligence. That's 2017. And 2018 in the BMJ, will AI make doctors obsolete? So all of it was going towards an existential threat to the medical profession, 2016 to 2018. In 2018, the largest scientific meeting annually around the world is called the RSNA, Radiological Society of North America, where there's 60,000 delegates meeting in Chicago. And Vic Rao uh, commented at that stage that medical students were afraid to do radiology because their jobs would go. So that's a huge threat to the radiology workforce, theoretically. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about what one obviously i don't think it is a threat i think all progress is re regarded by those involved at the time as not liking change and a threat but actually there's many more opportunities and it will all improve so what i'm going to do is i'm going to talk about the problems about data collection and this is going to be a huge issue for yourselves um, ai behind the scenes that we don't know about but need to know about where it fits in clinical practice the problems as it moves into clinical practice and probably the future. So when you develop an AI algorithm in uh, in imaging, in, in anything, but we're, we're specifying on imaging here, and I, I started developing an AI algorithm for uh, identification of primary nodules that were malignant back in 2010 and have been collecting data, data via a research protocol called PLAN since 2014 and have collected over 73,000 pulmonary nodules with ground truth. So you see, you need large volumes of data to develop it. You need large volumes of data because there's many factors you need to take into account. The data is not the same as a full blood count or biochemistry. When you say you go collect a chest x-ray on a patient who's got lung cancer, you need to know, was it their presentation chest x-ray? I'll show you why that's important. Um, you then need to know what quality the chest x-ray was, how, 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 how certain you are that the, it is lung cancer. Um, so you need to have the outcome. So it need, the data needs to be well curated and validated in a way that full blood counts and biochemistry and lung function tests and things like that don't have to be. You also need to know where it fits in the data pathway. So the reason for that being that actually, are you collecting data at the end when the lumps got bigger or are you collecting it at the beginning when it's got smaller? And you need to be able to relate it to the full blood count because if you're going to use multimodal AI and combine stuff, as I'll show you later on, that needs to be linked and linked pre-treatment, et cetera. And also outcomes change. So one of the problems you'll be aware is that there was an awful lot of interest in developing algorithms on chest x-rays and CTs to diagnose COVID and whether the patients were going to require ventilation or die. But of course, as the pandemic went along, went on, treatments changed, patients were treated better and their outcomes changed. So if you developed an algorithm based on CT, as they did in France, where there are 10,000 CTs, all carefully um, curated and validated and related to when the patients needed oxygen at the beginning 
of the pandemic, it would be entirely different at the end of the pandemic. So you need to bear that in mind. And that's a huge risk for the companies. The other thing is, if you're collecting, and I am now collecting 300,000 lung cancer screening data sets, you can't get patient consent for 300,000 episodes. It's just not possible. So how do you do that? How do you make the patients aware of it? How do you get their permission? Or if you don't get the permission, how you manage those data sets? How do you take the ones out if 99% of patients say yes, or 98% as in our survey, then how do you take out the one or 2% that don't want you to collect their data? And then who, do you, who charges for the data? Do the hospitals charge? Does the NHS charge? Do the trust charge? Do the CCG charge? Do the patients charge? Does anybody charge? Because someone might is planning to make money from the algorithm at the end. And then if you've got an algorithm and you're using it, one of the things that's being suggested is that royalties are charged. Now, if an algorithm was developed on 100 chest x-rays and they were selling it a pound a shot to each hospital, and then in version two, the 100 chest x-rays came from one hospital, but 10,000 chest x-rays comes from other hospitals. How do you divide up the royalties for those algorithms? Who audits it? Who tracks it? Etc. That's just on data collection, and that is not solved anywhere in the world. What they do in America is they just sell the data, and in India and other countries, um, by, by a certain agreements. We don't do that to a certain extent here, although a number of companies have got agreements with hospitals where they have access to their data, and they're signed up to paying them royalties, and they pay them a signing on fee. And one hospital has got one company's got 15 large hospitals signed up to provide its data to them. But the staff don't know that and the patients don't know it. So you need to bear all of that in mind as we talk about AI algorithms and their development. The other thing I said was about technology and happening in the background. So this is a PET CT scan and the image on the far right beside the GE logo is a standard acquisition at four minutes at full dose. And using artificial intelligence, that's four minutes per bed position, and there's about seven bed positions. So, and the bed position is about 19 centimeters. Then you move it along and along. So you can see it takes about 20 minutes to do a foot whole person or 25 minutes to a whole person. The artificial intelligence algorithm takes the data that's collected earlier on, 20 seconds or a minute, and tries to predict what it's going to be like at four minutes. And therefore you hope to be able to reduce the amount of time required to scan the patient, or you can reduce the dose because you scan for longer with lower doses. So maybe the artificial intelligence algorithm can reduce the dose required, which would obviously be great for children and for patients that require multiple scans. The question is, is the information the same with the AI developed um, image and, and quantitative data as the non-AI and how do you determine that and does it matter? And the answer is it does matter. Here is a PET CT scan on a patient with a small lung cancer, the bright yellow blob in the middle of the lung on the left. Now that's one patient scanned once and the algorithm reconstructed the data differently and that the lung cancer becomes hotter and clearly it hasn't become hotter. It's not more avid, but its quantitative measures have gone up. Now, if you didn't know that, you might overinterpret benign nodules as now becoming cancer. Has that happened? Absolutely it has. And to the extent that the Lymphoma Society has insisted in Europe and, and Britain has insisted that when interpreting lymphoma scans, you do not use the modern reconstruction algorithms, you use the old ones, because the clinical treatment data was based upon the old algorithms and not the new ones. And you might think, well, that's just one example. The International Association of Staging Lung Cancer does not include PET-CT, which is commonly performed in any of its staging criteria because of the variability. So although there's a very modern test, because of the variations in how it's used and developed, it's not included. So it's a big problem. It's a very large problem. And the final thing is because technology, in terms of technology, because technology is changing all the time. And so in PET-CT, we're, we're going from conventional um, 
detectors to digital detectors, we will be able to detect nodules and areas of avidity 10 times less than currently. So the algorithm might, if it wasn't, if it wasn't trained on digital PET, might start to see and call a whole bunch of things that are of no relevance at all to anybody because it is now seeing them. And that, as you can imagine, is a big problem if you're developing an algorithm and want to sell it and someone says, yeah, but that's yesterday's algorithm. So how do you build in changes in technology and changes in pathways? It, now I'll move on from technology to AI in terms of the things that I think you're probably more familiar with. Just, and you probably all know this, that this AI means many things to many different people. And um, what there are in terms, if you want to look it up in terms of imaging, there's a nice article in radiology on AI that categorizes them according to the FDA classification of accepting algorithms from CAD-Q, which is quantification, to CAD-E, which is detection, um, simple triage and diagnosis. And the most difficult one, is computer-aided diagnosis. That's what most people think of when they're thinking about AI in medicine, is, is the computer gonna make a diagnosis that the doctor isn't? And we've already talked about those many other things, but that's what most people think of. But that's the hardest thing to do and the biggest hurdle. Um, and as far as I'm aware, there are only two AI algorithms um, licensed by the FDA for diagnosis in comparison to humans. One in mammography, and one that's ours in lung cancer nodules. So what I'm gonna do is run through some of the problems with um, that about AI in medicine using those, those titles. So here is a CT scan with a pulmonary nodule highlighted in yellow. To put it in context, about 25% of adults that are scanned have a pulmonary nodule incidentally discovered. And about 2% of those pulmonary nodules, we've just completed a study, multi center study with thousands of patients, about 2% of those nodules in patients without a history of cancer turn out to be a very early cancer. So can you detect those? And what do you have to do to diagnose those? And what do you have to do to make that diagnosis? Now, when I see that scan, I, I, I'll know whether it's new, a new nodule or an old nodule. I'll know the cancer history. I'll know whether a smoker. I'll know a whole bunch of other stuff that's written on the request card. When the algorithm it has been developed, I don't know whether the algorithm has been told whether that's new, old, cancer history, smoker. I don't know how it's been validated. Now, to put it in context, these are all the confounders that you need to take into account for just assessing a single pulmonary nodule, which is the patient, how big the patient is as well, the nodule, how big it is, where it is, whether the patient's got other comorbidities, such as whether they've been operated on the smoker, the pathway through which they've come down, is it incidental? Were they a previous patient with cancer five, 10 years ago? Are they, is it a screening scan? How the image was acquired, whether they were given intravenous contrast or not, because that alters it. And to show you the significance of that, the, the nodules that I've been collecting since 2014, working with hospitals such as Leeds, they changed their scanner type so that it worked better. So that when they gave intravenous contrast, the nodules enhanced more. And because of that, our algorithm thought that we had cured cancer in Leeds because the nodules were now all high attenuation and the algorithm knew that cancers were not of high attenuation. So we wiped out all lung cancers in Leeds just by changing the um, acquisition um, using a different kind of type of scanner. So uh, and another sort of story, apocryphal story to explain this stuff, that when I first started, uh, I was collecting nodules from the Churchill Hospital and the John Radcliffe Hospital, and the algorithm within a few weeks seemed to be pretty good, much better than I'd anticipated. And the way it had done it, it was reading the DICOM header and the DICOM header that said Churchill on it, it, it learned that Churchill was where the cancer hospital was. And therefore all it was doing was looking and saying it was more likely to be cancer if it was from the Churchill than if it was from the John Radcliffe. So there's a lot of information you need to take into account to get this stuff right. So moving on to how good it is or how good, how not good it is, there's been a, a raft of literature showing that actually um, you can triage chest x-rays to interpret them better 
using deep learning algorithms AI. And here's one that shows that um, you did much better um, using the deep learning algorithm um, to triage them so they got reported immediately. There's a couple of things about this. The first of which is one of the uh, um, examples they showed, there was a pneumonia in the left lower lobe and the machine, the algorithm missed it. So you have to take into account the significance of what it misses, yes? And that needs to be defined up front. So there's no good saying that because most humans wouldn't miss uh, uh, that sort of left low lobe pneumonia. And the radiographer, if they saw the patient, the patient was on antibiotics, had a temperature and had that chest x-ray, the radiographer would make that diagnosis. So you need to take into account the clinical context and the significance of errors that have been made. Does, does, does it matter? Well, humans aren't great either to a certain extent. And on the left, the black and white graph was a paper from Turkington uh, well, almost 20 years ago. And Turkington showed, he showed that, excuse me, that actually if you miss cancers on chest x-rays, the patients do worse, not that surprising. There's obviously lead time bias in there, but if you, if you, even if you allow for lead time bias, but actually you need to detect them early. The colored graph on the right shows, is from ISLAT, the International Association of Staging Lung Cancer. And that, that, that shows with hundreds of thousands of patient data sets that patients do worse, the larger the pulmonary nodule is or the, the lung cancer is. So it both makes sense. You want to detect it early, and if you don't detect it early, the patients do worse. And here's one that um, is, is not from our unit, but I've collected with a missed lung cancer, and you can see it in the left lower zone there, and it was missed, and then it got bigger. Now, the average size missed is about 1.4 centimeters, believe it or not. We don't know why that one was missed. Maybe the um, radiologist spotted it, but forgot to report it. Maybe the phone went and they thought they had reported it. Maybe they just missed it. We've no idea why, okay? We know that some people are better at spotting lung cancers than others and that you can train them. And we know this is a deep learning based automatic detection algorithm for spotting lung cancers. And we know that actually, if you use the deep learning algorithm according to the literature, you are going to miss less cancers and you're not going to overcall and you won't request too many CT scans. So it seems great. And this is a very good unit um, from Korea good group of scientists but in this they haven't told us how good the readers were to start with so we don't know and i'll talk about this a bit later we don't know whether actually they were all superb or not superb we don't know whether the algorithm this is missed lung cancers that they'd found to detect we don't know if they had ten thousand chest x-rays and the cancers were turning out randomly how good it would be and we also don't know how good the chest x-rays were. We don't know whether they excluded five or 10% of the chest x-rays because the patients were morbidly obese, they were lying supine as opposed to erect, whether they rotated or not. And more of the same, this is um, computer-aided detection for pulmonary nodules on CT. And there's been 20 years of literature showing how using CAD improves our detection ability, not just on chest x-rays previously, but on CT. And this is a, a recent paper um, from 2019 that shows the radiologists using deep learning got better, a couple of examples of it. But they excluded scans when they were inadequate, when there was motion artifact, when the radiologists couldn't use ground truth. So actually, this isn't, this isn't the real world, is it? This is um, an artificial world to enable the algorithms to do well. So an example here of a patient with pulmonary fibrosis and a pulmonary nodule. We don't know whether the nodules detected in this study, which is a good study, whether actually any of them had pulmonary fibrosis, whether they had had prior thoracotomies, pleural effusions, heart failure, etc. And the answer is they won't have done. So when you look at detection algorithms, and there's going to be a raft of these in the NHS and around the world, it's not just the results. You need to look carefully at the inclusion and exclusion criteria, the comparator groups. And actually, can you use an algorithm developed here in Oxford in the Midwest of America? What about in India? What about in Asia and vice versa? What about 
an algorithm used developed in Korea, can you use it in the UK or the States? Do you have to test it in each environment? Does the company have to pay to do a prospective study in each environment? So a bit about Pumley nodules, I'll, I'll move on to some theoretical stuff in, in a minute. But so this is the stuff that I sort of cut my teeth on over the last 10 years. As I said, there's a very large number of um, nodules around the world. There's, but I think they estimated it costs about a billion dollars a year just to do follow-up scans on patients with incidental pulmonary nodules. So it's big money. And here's a, couple of, here's a pulmonary nodule. And because we don't know, and this is before, as you see, 2012, before AI came along, what the BTS guidelines suggested you do is you follow them up and you see whether the nodules have grown. And if they've grown, they're more likely to be malignant than if they've not grown. That makes common sense. That's obviously common sense, apart from the fact that obviously inflammatory nodules have to grow as well. So what the BTS suggested we do, the British Stress Society, is that if you see a nodule, you measure its diameter or its volume. And if it's, if it's greater than eight millimeters, you put it in something called the Brock risk model. And if the Brock model, which was developed on lung cancer screening data, suggests that there's a greater than 10% risk of malignancy, you should do a PET CT scan or you can biopsy it, et cetera. And if it's not, then you do, you do um, you just survey them at a year. So this is when the, nod when the nodule presents. So it's when it presents there um, is when you put it in the Brock model. Now, we have developed a, 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 an algorithm, the optimum one I'm talking about, which outperforms the Brock model. So we've done this in the UK and we've done it in the States and we've shown that it doesn't outperform it by much, but it outperforms it enough for it actually to reduce the numbers of follow-up scans that, you, you, that are required. Here is what you put in the Brock model. You can download it as an app and you just put in how old the patient is, sex, family history, emphysema, nodule size, categorize the morphology of it, where it is, how many there are, and whether it's smoother out or, or irregular. And then it gives you a cancer probability. And if the cancer probability is more than 10%, you investigate it. And if it's not, then you do a follow-up scan. Okay, so that's what, how the Brock model works. So the question is, if you look at the algorithm that we've developed, is it just a way of measuring size better than a radiologist measuring with a pair of Sorry, a radiologist measuring with a pair of calipers. Have we developed, spent, what, about 20 million pounds and 12 years of my life developing a, a, a smart pair of calipers, okay? And the reason why this is important is trying to work out how the algorithm actually works. So what we did was we took the nodules from the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial in the States with 55,000 patients, and we ended up with a whole bunch of nodules. And then we had them measured, the nodules measured manually, the radiologists with a pair of calipers, and using a downloadable from UNET's automated segmentation algorithm, we got the, the algorithm to um, measure the maximum axial diameter and then to pretend the nodule was a sphere and to give us the equivalent spherical diameter. So we've got three measurements of diameter and we compared that to the lung cancer prediction model. So the three measurements as we put it in the Brock model. And what we showed was that the lung cancer, the AI algorithm outperformed the Brock model um, no matter what, whether it was the manual, the automatic or the spherical. So it's doing something, appears to be doing something other than just measuring diameter. So what we did then was to see if we could take things out to see whether it altered the model's prediction of malignancy. So this is the model in its entirety, the black box being the AI algorithm. And what we did then was we took, this would be a nodule, we moved 15 millimeters to the right or the left, up or down, so it was just looking at the lung, the model was, we put it in the black box and we got the risk of malignancy. We, we actually removed the parenchyma, the lung background, so it could only look at the morphology, or we covered the morphology up, this is artificially with um, a sphere, an implanted sphere, so it couldn't look at the edge of the nodule. 
And what we showed was, I think this is the most interesting bit, which is that the algorithm looking at lung alone was better than chance at predicting whether the patient had got that nodule was malignant or not. Um, and it all went all the way up with the morphological factors appearing, i.e. speculation and stuff being more important than the lung background, et cetera. But actually the AI algorithm was better than the sum of those and better than just the parenchyma alone. So it's doing more than we know, um, but it's also looking at the lung parenchyma. So if the algorithms are so good, is it actually game over for radiologists when they get them right? Or, or nurses or technicians developing them or using them? Well, you'll know this um, better than I probably, or some of you will, which is that algorithms don't like uncertainty and don't like dirty data. And as you, there's a couple of papers looking, looking at this, and this is obviously a dog, a skier in a building. And as the image gets worse, the algorithm would eventually not be able to interpret this as accurately, but we're still happy to call that a dog, a skier, and okay, hard on a building, but able to see it. And I like this one. They developed an algorithm to um, identify COVID, and then they bunged in a cat, and the algorithm not having seen, because obviously the algorithm is not interested in whether it, it's a picture of a cat, because it just treats data all the same, it was fairly confident that the cat was COVID, obviously not having had COVID, although there have been a few reports of cats having COVID. So in, in other words, looking at unseen data or dirty data doesn't really work for algorithms. And we know this because going back to the general hype about driverless cars, and you'll know the difference between closed and open environments for both testing, training, and validating algorithms. And they work very well in a closed environment which is I, you totally control the circumstances in which you're using it. Once you use it in an open environment, they really struggle, which is why you have to put drivers behind the wheel if they're going to be um, uh, in a totally open environment. And what the algorithms are good at would be, for instance, identifying a duck or a telly, but they would be poor at identifying the fact that a duck wouldn't be watching a telly on top of a farm roof. And the same about that, and the same about who rides a bicycle upside down um, on sands, nobody. So algorithms are, are, are good at single tasks, but are, are poor at dealing with them out of context. So closed and open environments, you need to bear that in mind. So let's just assume you've got a good algorithm. And here is a pulmonary nodule in three different planes. This is the same nodule actual grown on sagittal planes on a lung CT. Now, what we did was we got the radiologists, we got um, 10 of them of different seniority to, um, and we, they looked at a couple of hundred of these nodules, and we asked them to give a risk looking at it of it being malignant. And then we gave them the information from the algorithm, and then we got to see if they wanted to change their mind. And in terms of getting closer to truth, all the radiologists, all the readers got better overall. So that sort of suggests maybe it is game over. Maybe, maybe actually it makes everybody better. But actually it doesn't, because what we don't know is we don't know the quality of the radiologists, as I've mentioned before, but also we don't know for any individual nodule whether they're going to perform better on that nodule than the algorithm. And actually they may have got it right for that nodule, but now have changed their minds because of the algorithm. So we, we don't know the context in which it should use it. And this paper from Nature Communications looked at lung cancer screening. Um, it's from Google. And what they said was that when there was no prior imaging available, their algorithm in, performed better than the radiologists. Now, we know in lung cancer screening that you always have the prior information available because it's a standard trial, so it is available. So actually, this is incorrect. And they said when prior CT imaging, the incorrect circumstances, when prior imaging was available, the model performed better, it was on par with the same radiologist. But that's just, not, that's just looking at the imaging data. It doesn't take into account anything else, and they weren't using the Brock model. 
So you just have to be wary how you're going to use these and how the companies have got around this. That sounds pejorative. It's not meant to be is that they are going to allow the doctors that use this to set the threshold on how good the new, how good the algorithm are. So here is a chest x-ray. This is from, G, from GE. It's a identification. It's called the critical care suite, the CCS. And what they're going to do is they have developed it so it can identify pneumothoraces. And there is a pneumothorax. And here the algorithm has developed, has identified it. But what they're going to do is they're going to let the doctors set the threshold for the size of the pneumothorax and for the sensitivity and specificity, i.e. the algorithm's confidence that it's present. So one, that means that you're not suing GE because the doctor has set the threshold. And two, the doctor can decide whether it wants to override it or not because it knows that it's not 100% sensitive and 100% specific. But does that reduce the utility of the algorithms? So do you have to be Einstein or can any old Muppet use these algorithms? And how do you train the Muppets? That's the question. So do you remember I said at the beginning, 2016 to 2018, that they were saying doctors, and they also said lawyers, but doctors were going to be out of train, uh, out of um, uh, become unemployed. Well, now it looks as though they're moving. This is towards the end of this is middle of 2018. And by 2020, this is from General uh, uh, American Medical Association from JAMA, JAMA as well. And actually what they're saying is the promise of AI hasn't been realized. And there are some significant unintended consequences of using the algorithms and how they're going to be used. So uh, this, is, this is applicable to anything that you need to evaluate it really carefully. I think the measurements of disease will improve using AI. I'm pretty sure they will actually. Eventually, when we can work out who gets trained, how they get trained and how good, your, your, um, how good people are, you can, it will start to help. This is the bit I'm going to talk about in just 30 seconds um, before I end which is the ability to combine CT data, as humans do, combine it all, CT, biochemistry, lung function, et cetera, in a way we can't currently do, that will make a difference. But I think the other thing that the colleges, the societies, and the NHS providers have not cottoned on to is whether it's good or not, AI is actually out there and it produces a measurement. So as I showed you about those pulmonary nodules, so now you're comparing yourself to something. Previously, it wasn't possible uh, and you wouldn't get a unified answer. Now you're comparing yourself to something or you're employing people whose performance can be compared to a standard, albeit not gold. Actually, that is, in many respects, one of the greatest advantages that AI is going to do. It's going to enable people to know how good they are and also eventually, hopefully, how they might get better. So two more slides and then I'm done. This is to the multimodal data that I was talking about. So this is what we're, what we're currently doing, uh, a study called DART, where we're ca capturing 300,000 patient data points that are all being screened for lung cancer and they're having CT data, the, the clinical data, their lung function and blood. And we're going to combine that and hopefully we will be able to produce an algorithm that takes into account prote protein data within the blood sample, um, circulating tumor DNA. I've talked about that for hours, circulating tumor DNA. By the way, that's not gonna solve the world's problems, not in any great hurry, um, and end up being able to predict better who's got lung cancer in a small pulmonary nodule and remove the need for lung biopsies in the lung cancer screening program. This is what I'm talking about, multimodal data, an example of it. This is work we've been doing with a chap called Min Suk Kim, um, who was my postdoc, who's now in Loughborough. And what, what he's done, working initially with Tom Povey in engineering, is taking CT data, and into it you put lung function data, so the stuff that's routinely connected, and you can calculate tissue elasticity. And from a static breath hold CT, you can identify, you can develop um, ventilation patterns within the lungs. So that, that CT moving 
is actually from a static breath hold CT. And we've compared it to other um, technologies, uh, techniques to look at regional ventilation within the lungs. Um, and it, to Minsuk's credit, it won a prize and was regarded as one of the greatest advances uh, a couple of years back this pre-COVID in lung function imaging. So I'll just end with this slide. So one of the things that uh, medicine does and science does, it teaches people to look at things in multiple different ways. So you can look at this, uh, it's obviously one drawing and you can look at it and you might see a young woman or you might see an old woman or some of you will be able to decide, see them both and decide that they're going to look and see a young woman and some of you will be able to look and you'll be able to pick which one you, you see. So um, when, when there's a great deal of uncertainty, there's many different ways of looking at AI and there's an awful lot of unanswered questions about how we might use it. So I'll stop there if I may, and I'll answer any questions if you have any. Yeah, we've had a few questions. Thank you so much. That was a really great talk, really interesting. Um, okay, so yeah, we've had quite a few questions. Um, so one early one was we had somebody ask, is the Brock model a Bayesian network model? Say again? Is the Brock model a Bayesian network model? Yes. There yes. we go. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's just a mathematical model, yeah, developed from lung cancer screening data. Very good. Yeah. Um, and somebody else asked, do you think the NHS is better situated to use an AI approach to healthcare due to the huge amount of data sharing? Um, yes and no. So um, yes, that's because patients have a unique NHS number, it is possible to trace them and find the data. No, because um, there isn't as much data sharing as you imagine in the NHS. And no, because the quality of the data is extremely variable. So, you know, the, the, some of the scanners that patients are scanned on are 20 years old and some of them were installed yesterday. And so that, there's all sorts of issues about that. It's so yes and no. It's not as good an environment as the politicians think. Great. Sadly. Uh <laughs> Somebody else has asked um, about the software developed by GE. Will the need to specify all of these parameters require more time from radiologists? No, most, most of it. So I, I'm not sure that's going to be an issue because most of it is automatic entry. Um, the, the thing to think about is how you're going to use the software. Are you going to have to send everything up into the cloud and have an answer down? So is everyone's EPR, electronic patient record, and everyone's imaging PACS system all going to be connected? Are they going to be connected to 120 different software providers? So you press this button for a CT chest, you press this button for a head CT, you press this button for a big toe x-ray. How's anybody going to work that out? And are we going to have to pay a subscription model for each of those? Are we going to pay a per use model? Um, and kind of on the other end of that, somebody has asked, do you think this technology will ever hit a point where we don't need radiologists anymore? I would hope so. Because <laughs> I'm 62, so it's not going to affect me. Um, well, I'm pretty sure that for a large amount of the things that we do, such as lung cancer screening on patients who've not had previous illness or head CTs and things like that, the answer will be yes. But I think we're a long, sadly, we're a very long way away from that because uh, I've got a couple of slides which I haven't shown called Before You Go, which are that the patient's being scanned for one thing, but they have something else. So if your algorithm isn't able to do everything, then actually they're going to make mistakes. Mm. Uh, and somebody else has asked about AI within triage. Um, do you think it will become a kind of backup support where use of AI will be common or mandatory? And do you think there's any use within A&E or emergency imaging? So uh, I, I, I'm going to say yes, but with a heavy heart. So the, the NHS is being convinced, the purchasers are being convinced that using triage mechanisms will save time and eventually money. It might but I was on a panel with 
uh, one of the regulators from the FDA. And to be approved by the FDA for a triage model is, and the quantification model, so just measurements, is, is much simpler and much cheaper than um, a diagnostic model. But he said, the issue is, is it important to triage? So triaging a prostate biopsy, I know this is what I asked, but I'll come to that, but to give an example, triaging a prostate biopsy into ones that have cancer versus ones that don't have cancer. So the cancer ones are reported first, requires the algorithm to always get it right. So it doesn't put patients with bad cancers at the bottom. Problem number one. Problem number two, with prostate cancer, it probably doesn't matter if your biopsy is reported today or next Monday. So triaging it is, it might be clever, but pointless. The issue I have with the, the ED stuff is at the moment, we are not training our ED stuff. There is no formal training program for the fraction, the nurses that see you, that whether they're dealing with major trauma and fracture or the doctors to get them better to look at chest x-rays. So saying we're going to skip the bit about training people well, and we're going to use an algorithm because they're not doing a good job, I think is cart and horse time. I think, you know, I think we should train people better and then see if you can improve their performance using software. Does that make sense? So at the moment, there's no training program in any of the specialties at all um, for interpreting imaging. There are training programs for using imaging. So in chest medicine, that they are trained on, they are trained on how to use ultrasound and say same, same with the ED doctors, but interpreting chest x-rays and other stuff, there isn't a program. And I think if you're a stroke doctor, I think that you should undergo formal training in interpreting CT. They're very good at it, but why not have proper training, get them as good as you can, assess them properly, and then see if an algorithm adds something rather than just say, let's just buy an algorithm. Thank you, that was a really great answer. Um, we have a couple of people who seem to be concerned about being replaced as radiologists. Um, so <laughs> one person... No one will be replaced as it, not in your lifetimes. <laughs> yeah, so not we've your asked about what you think the time scale of replacement will be. And then somebody else has asked, what do you think the next steps will be to develop AI to replace radiologists? Yeah, okay. So, so I can't, I, I mean, I can't predict I mean, it's impossible to predict 20 or 30 or 40 years ahead, isn't it? Let's be honest about it. But what, what do I, if you look historically at uh, uh, what happened? So when I was a, a junior doctor, there were two CT scanners in the whole of the country. OK, that was 1983 odd. And then when I became a consultant in Oxford in 1990, there was one magnet for the whole of Oxford and the Thames Valley, one MRI scanner. So, you know, who would have known that now we've got nine CTs in Oxford, eight MR scanners, and they're running eight till eight, seven days a week? Who, who would know? So predicting the use of imaging is fraught with difficulty. And then predicting how algorithms are going to be developed and used is, is fraught with difficulty. There are some givens. It will do things that we're bad at, that can be done. So... If, if you want to be a radiologist because you want to spend your time with a pair of electronic calipers measuring things, you're toast. Yeah. So it's going to replace that. But is it going to replace your ability to interpret the, the chest physician comes down to you and says, this patient's short of breath, their lung function is this. And you look at the CT scan and you go, it's not explained by that CT scan. There must be another reason for their lung function to be that abnormal. Algorithms are a long way away from that. So in terms of your ability to use your brain and interpret imaging, 20, 30, 40 years away, and all that's going to happen is, yeah, the image I showed you at the end of the, the lungs moving, Someone's going to have to interpret that data, yeah, even though it's developed by an algorithm. And the same with the dark data. So the circulating tumor DNA, let's use that as an example. Everyone, the government is just purchasing from Grail, they're doing a, a fast track study 
to show that circulating tumor DNA can diagnose cancers and select patients better. Not a chance. And I, and I mean, they didn't listen to me. Actually, they didn't ask me, but I've been involved in setting the trials up. And I said, so you do a, C, you do a scan, uh, you measure circulating tumor DNA, and it says you've got a lung cancer. Okay. You do a pa the scan on the patient, they've got four nodules. Which of those is going to be cancer then? And is the algorithm going to be 100% correct? Or is the doctor going to say, the algorithm thinks it's that one, but I know that in patients with pulmonary fibrosis, the nodules that look more solid areas are going to be cancer. So, uh, so in other words, the stuff is going to get harder for you, you guys. It's going to get much more interesting and much more fun. So no, it's not going to replace you in any kind of hurry. So you wouldn't warn the medical students off training as radiologists? I know it's entirely up to, I think it's, you know, would I do radiology again? I don't know whether I would or not, because I'm just fed up with everyone saying it's the surgeons and the oncologists that are the only important people in medicine. I'm kidding. I'd do radiology again. I'd do it at your age. Okay, so we've had a couple of people ask about controlling biases. So somebody's asked about how do you control biases for multimodal data? And yeah. then um, people are also wondering about um, how you would account for different patient factors, so I guess relating to like pulmonary fibrosis and things, yeah. how do AI to account for that? Yeah, so the, the controlling for bias requires uh, an awful lot of forethought, understanding of where the biases might be, and then having large data sets. And that's the best that you can do. And I think, again, um, I don't think I don't think those within and I'm, I'm highlighting the problems. I'm not talking about the, the good things, because I think it's the problems that cause you to think yourselves to think, because this is you using your brains and hopefully helping us all in the future as you move into these fields, because what I've been talking about applies in other things as well. Um, uh, but I think I think regional um, data bias is a huge problem. It is is an unconsidered problem um, because of um, race, socioeconomic deprivation, etc. I think it's 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 a far bigger problem for these algorithms than has been identified. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And leading on from that, actually, somebody has thanked you for the talk and also said, um, what do you think will be the value in large international collaborative approaches in solving these problems? And do you think these are feasible with the current data availability and funding systems? Uh, <laughs> so dealing with the funding system, if you're talking about Brexit, that's a problem. I've got a grant that's been frozen for about 18 months because of Brexit. Um, the Americans, you can apply for an NIHR grant, so that's uh, NIH grant, and we're NIHR. So, and that, so they, they, the Americans fund outside America's studies, so that's if, if they're good enough, and they're very encouraging, and I've been party to some of those. So, and as to, there's shed loads of money out there for research and for AI. There's just um, bucket loads if you can de develop a good team. There are grants that are multinational. I have a grant that's multinational looking at something called mesothelioma, plural tumor, secondary to asbestos exposure. And that doesn't, that has genetic, uh, regional variation related to the amount of asbestos exposure, but doesn't seem to have any racial or morphological or, or socioeconomic changes. So I think some of the, so the answer is there's plenty of opportunity, but you need to take it into account. More of an issue is, uh, is uh, GDPR and data protection issues. That's a that's a bigger issue. Interesting. Um, and then from a kind of clinical approach, somebody's asked, do you think patients should worry about only being seen by an algorithm through the future and not seeing face to face? I don't know. I, I, I mean, I, I don't know the answer to that. If you've run British Gas, all you ever want to do is talk to a person because it, gets, it says press button seven press button nine and then it says goodbye after about half an hour and it hasn't solved your problem so i think people will get used to it i think um some of the stuff absolutely but being told that you're sick and um, having time to discuss what the options are that's an inter human interaction thing isn't it you know so i don't think it'll ever replace that having an out you you have a chest x-ray and the algorithm look at it and tell you what's on it I think people could get used to that, don't you? I think that that, and then, you know, being seeing their image. 
but they're going to have to be pretty good those algorithms mm. aren't they yeah. but i think yeah i think I they think can get used to adoption of a lot of the gp kind of survey approaches to initial consultations so I don't yeah, the GPs, as an aside, the GPs have been hammered by the government about that because um, there's been some reason why they wanted to pick a fight with the doctors at the end of the pandemic. But obviously it was a deliberate approach um, uh, because they're not that naive. They have done it on purpose. And it also doesn't make sense from the point of view that the government has invested and is supporting hugely a company called Babylon, which is, you know, AI through and through, Babylon is now starting to offer face-to-face -face appointments because you can't do it all by AI. So um, the government is trying to have its cake and eat it too, eat it too promoting AI and non-face-to-face -face, and then criticizing the GPs and then suggesting to a Babylon that they introduce face-to-face. -face. So it's, it's, this is a political thing rather than anything else. And the GPs are seeing shed loads more people and I don't know about you, my daughter's 30, she's in London, she wants a GP opinion, she'd rather do it on Zoom rather than track across London. Yeah, yeah she so loves it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. Okay, uh, so I think that's it for questions. We have one person who's asked about who would be a good person to contact if they're interested in getting involved with AI assisted research. Um, uh, uh, okay, it would depend on what AI is. So, um, Jens Richer is Professor of Engineering that I work with in the Department of Engineering and he's a terrific chat if you are interested in doing the development. We've got a couple of PhD students who are doing really interesting things like trying to co-register um, CT data to histological data. So pathology is being digitised. The scale difference is 100 to 1. So, um, and there's all sorts of voxel clustering and techniques that they're trying to develop with AI. So Jens would be, if you're interested in that point of view, would be good. Uh, Alice Noble is the professor of engineering who's developing really neat software um, in ultra, there's, it depends on what you're after. Um, so you can always, that person or others can always email me outlining what they're after or just general, and I'll try and point them in the right direction if you if they'd like if you or anyone else would like i can't promise they'll take you up and also there's timings related to this stuff but i will certainly anyone who's enthusiastic about this stuff we always try and encourage it's great thank you jens is actually one of my supervisors is he oh yeah. there you go he's terrific isn't he really nice guy yeah absolutely lovely guy okay great so i think that's it yeah i think all the other questions you covered in the talk yeah, that's great. Oh, thank you very much. That's All great. right, well, thank you very much. And thank you everyone else for taking the time to listen to, to me. This is my attic. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, thanks, Holly. You take care. Take that's care, great. everyone. Bye now. Bye.